Good morning. Good morning from the um, uh, U.S. East Coast, and good evening to those in Asia, late afternoon in Europe. Uh, welcome to the second session of our virtual workshop on 30 years of the internet in China. Uh, my name is uh, Yang Guobin. Um, I direct the uh, Center on Digital Culture and Society at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, last night, we held the first session of this virtual workshop. Both of these sessions are part of a series of scholarly events marking the 30th anniversary of China's connection to the internet. A month ago, exactly a month ago, we held an in-person event which convened scholars on the U.S. East Coast who are close closer to Philadelphia. There will also be a roundtable on the same topic at the annual meeting of the International Communication Association in June this year. This series of events is the collective endeavor of several institutions, including our own Center on Digital Culture and Society and the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania, the College of Media and International Culture at Zhejiang University, and the Department of Media and Communication at City University of Hong Kong. We are honored to have the support of the Sage Journal Communication and the Public, edited by Professor Hong Yu at Zhejiang University and Professor Christine Huang at City University of Hong Kong. I would like to thank all these collaborators for undertaking this project. I also want to thank the organizing team at the University of Pennsylvania. They're all here on screen. They are Dr. Jin Yi Gu, who is a postdoctoral fellow in our Center on Digital Culture and Society. Dr. Jun Yi Lu, who is a postdoctoral fellow at our Center for the Study of Contemporary China, and Ms. Chen Dan, who is the administrative coordinator in our Center on Digital Culture and Society. Chen has worked very hard behind the scene to make all the logistical and technical arrangements. Today, we have six speakers who will speak in the order listed on the program. I'll introduce them very briefly. And after our speakers finish their presentations, we'll take questions from the audience through the Q&A function. Feel free to submit your questions uh, through Q&A anytime. Our first speaker, Dr. Jun Liu, is Associate Professor in the Department of Communication, Copenhagen University in Denmark. And the topic of his uh, talk is Reflections on Studying the Internet and contentious politics in China. Our second speaker is Gianluigi Negro, associate professor in the Department of Philology and Criticism of Ancient and Modern Literatures in Siena University, Italy. He will speak on studying the internet in China through metaphors. Our third speaker, Gabriel De Seta, is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bergen, Norway and he will speak on the topic from ASCII greetings to synthetic live streams, three decades of Chinese digital folklore. Next is Pro Professor Florin Schneider, who is Chair Professor of Modern China and Director of Asia Center at Leiden University, the Netherlands. He will speak on the topic, nationalisms on China's evolving internet. Next is uh, Dino Gezhang, who is a uh, assistant professor in the School of Creative Media, City University of Hong Kong. And the title of his talk is A Decade of Chinese Game Studies in Retrospect. Last but not least, we have Dr. Lin Zhang, who is associate professor in the Department of Communication and Media Studies, University of New Hampshire. And the topic of her talk is platformized family production, social reproduction, and e-commerce in rural China. With that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Jun Liu. Okay, so I hope you can you can see my slides. Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you, Professor Yang. So I would like to first uh, express my gratitude to Professor Yang, uh, Jing Yi, Jun Yi, and also Trump for organizing the 30 years of the internet in China. So I'm really looking forward to so provoking discussions and new insights on the study of the internet in China. So my topic is slightly, like the title is slightly different from uh, the one in the program, but I think it bears the same idea. So basically today I would like to share with you, you could say three proposals based on my research that aims to advance our understandings of the internet and the contention politics in China. So my departing point is that you could say the ongoing exploration of the impact of digital technology and uh, internet in this case on contention politics is one of the persistent areas of the internet study. And in this case, when I talk about contention politics, I refer to the definition defined by Citaro that involves ordinary people joining forces in confrontation with elites, authorities, and opponents. So my intention of using this concept is to highlight, you could say, the antagonistic nature of political engagement in China's digital landscape. And you could say, retrospectively speaking, there has been a significant focus on the antagonistic nature of political engagement in study the internet in China. For example, Kluver and Yang notes in their review the what they call the overly focused attention on the democratization and emancipatory potential of the internet versus the regime's political control. But my departing point or my starting point is not to deny the value of starting the internet and contention politics. But I argue for a broader perspective that transcends a binary view of technology as either a democratizing force or a tool for repression. So this requires addressing, I would say, another persistent problem outlined actually by Professor Young's article in 2011, which is titled Technology and its Content Issues in the Study of the Chinese Internet. That involves considering the values, practices, history, culture, and political economy surrounding technology use. So addressing this, I believe, requests is brought in at these three dimensions further, which I will specify. So the first is the temporal dimension, the second is the mundane dimension, and the third is cross-demographical dimension. So let me start with the first proposal that is exploring the temporal dimension to understand the changes brought by, uh, brought about by the internet use in contention politics. So change has long been central to internet research. But I think the questions that remain are what kind of change are we referring to when discussing the impact of the internet on contention politics in China? So if in most cases we consider changes to be associated with a temporal dimension, then in what sense is such change defined over time if we look at the case of the Chinese internet? So certainly you could say some scholars have identified cases where the internet or digital media facilitate mediated protests or contention events while Others present evidence of the setback of activism in light of, for example, increasing control, suppression, and manipulation by the governments or the internet companies. But I think in the discussion of changes facilitated by the internet use, we must ask ourselves, that is, to which specific historical or temporal context do the changes identified in the research correspond? So my point again here is not to deny the current scholarship con uh, con uh, scholarship's contributions to our understanding of the internet in China. Instead, I want to highlight that you could say a prevailing assumptions in many existing studies, which is often unnoticed or unchallenged, is that by focusing on cases at specific points in time, so that's typically the moment when the case occurs, so the research can identify the changes brought out by the use of the internet in contention politics over time. 
But is that feasible is, or is that correct? So I argue in this case that such approach reflect a limit preference for examining what I call the snapshots of the internet and contention politics without necessarily integrating these observations into a broader temporal analysis that could offer a more, you could say, compelling discussion of the changes at play in this case. And then to overcome such limitations, so I propose considering temporality as Gokmanodo described as an explanatory dimension of social political phenomenon in starting the internet and contention politics. So in this case, you could say temporality is how periods of time, for example, the moment when the case occurs, so that periods of time connects and relates to other periods in both backward, so that's past, and forward, that's future direction. So I think research on the temporality or temporal dynamics of contention politics includes, for example, study of cycles of protest event and future imaginations. So I believe that the temporality capture, you could say, the essence of temporal flows and movements, wherein our experiences of the internet and contention politics are not isolated to the now or specific moments. So instead, these experiences engage with and are informed by memories of the past and anticipations of a future yet to come. So that's my first argument here. And my second proposal connects the discussion of contentious events to the mundane aspect of internet use. So in one of my earlier work, I highlighted the importance of everyday internet use as what I call a latent but essential infrastructure that builds and maintains network of solidarity and identity, which are crucial for political contention. So this extends beyond you could say the intensively started uh, marvelous moments of open defiance in this case. While my stance remains unchanged, I see two additional reasons to emphasize the significance of exploring the mundane in researching the internet and contention politics in China. So the first thing is that digital media or the internet are becoming more ubiquitous and less notable as the novelty fades. Therefore, the earlier, you could say, uh, dichotomous question of whether the internet promotes or hinders democratization needs to be dissected into more specific inquiries. So this will uncover the nuanced ways the internet might shape politics. And here I also want to argue that essentially our aims is not to predict outcomes for example, whether the internet will one day undermine the regime's control, but to explain processes in this case. So that's how specific adaptions and appropriations of the internet reflect the complexity of contention politics or politics in China, as well as the mechanisms that might mediate between everyday communication and diverse political outcomes. And my second point is that the actualization or manifestation of contention politics varied greatly in detail. So here I adapt Max Weber's observation. So he said that politics is a strong and slow boring of a hard boards requiring both passions and perspective. And I argue that we can see that contention politics similarly in this case involves, you could say, a mix of vigorous and subtle uh, efforts. So that actually suggests that alongside this vigorous use or uses of internet for, for example, mobilizing support and increasing visibility in contentions, we should also pay attention to the gradual or incremental progress. So that is the slow boring of hard boards in this case. And missing this aspect risk of missing Again, the essence of internet culture in China, which is characterized by, for example, playfulness uh, that can only be fully appreciated by examining both the uh, extraordinary or marvelous and the mundane. So to reiterate here, our goal is to explain the process 
through empirically grounded uh, research applicable to both marvelous and mundane scenario. So I move to my last argument. So that is the cross demographical dimension, I believe is quite crucial. Um, I think to study the internet or any topic you could say, we must first define our research objective. So in this case, what do we mean by the internet in China? And we should also think about like defining the internet, not just from a researcher's perspective, but more importantly, you could say from the user perspective. And this has significant implications. And because the internet cannot be started as a uh, monolithic entity, then it should be disaggregated into more discrete phenomena that include, for example, different social, uh, technical platforms and practices catered to different segments of population and encompass different temporal stage. For example, the, temp uh, the internet 30 years ago versus the, the, the internet nowadays. And here I also refer to one of the recent paper by, by uh, Jack Chu in this case, uh, they decide the issue from a geopolitical perspective. And the paper actually advocates for the term Chinese or Chi uh, Chinese internets. In this case, to acknowledge a uh, quote here is multi-layered and pluralistic nature. And this includes being, quote again, internally diverse and externally border crossing, among other characters, of course. So I think this is a, a significant point. For example, the meanings of the internet among the users or to say Wang Hongs, those self-employed digital entrepreneurs of Kuai Shou and Huo Shan, um, the meanings from there for them uh, differ significance from those of, you could say, the middle, urban middle class in this case. And the, these meanings of the internet emerge within the subcultural contexts of specific population segments, which are characterized by demographic characteristics such as gender, generation, ethnicity, language, career paths, education level. That, that, that means actually conducting this cross-demographical analysis challenges this default assumption of the internet as a uh, homogeneous uniform uh, platform, which often overlook the various and nuanced way different groups engage with and utilize uh, the internet or digital media. So I also believe that actually in the discourse of the uh, the internet and contention politics, it's quite crucial to look at this question, saying that how diverse interpretations and subsequent uses of the internet or digital media lead to largely fragmented cellular activisms and limit the scope and influence of contention politics in China. So I borrow the term cellular activism, which is coined by uh, Professor Kim Wa Li in the context of labor movement, labor activism. So here I refer to a broader pattern of segmentation and um, sporadic influence of internet mediated activism. So the focus here is on how divergent understandings and uses of the internet or digital media hinder the formation of broader cross demographic coalitions in contention politics in this case. So to conclude, so by addressing this temporal dimension, we I believe that we can pinpoint changes introduced by the adoption and appropriations of the internet. And then integrating this mundane in our investigation facilitates a translation where contention politics is understood in connection with broader uh, life context. And the last thing is considering this cross demographic dimension reveres the internet roles as more diverse, you could say, and complex than commonly suggests. So I believe that reframing the questions as suggest in in, in this, this proposal is crucial, is a crucial step towards achieving more, you could say, sophisticated explanations and the deeper understanding of the internet in China in the coming decades. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Jin Liu of um, Copenhagen University. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Negro from uh, Siena University, Italy. Okay, so thanks so much from my side to the organizer, Professor Yang, for this very inspiring workshop. So what I'll try to do during the next 10, 15 minutes is just to uh, provide a contribution to the discussion, this retrospective uh, discussion on the evolution of the Chinese internet in the last 30 years. Actually, my uh, essay, my, my work was mainly inspired by two previous works from uh, Professor Yang and Yu Ching, who already worked on the um, relevance of metaphor in approaching the historical analysis of Chinese digital media, the internet in particular. Because according to their previous works, we can um, um, we can acknowledge how metaphors had a concrete impact on uh, uh, the construction of uh, social imaginaries uh, through metaphors. But from a more uh, theoretical perspective, uh, my essay is also uh, was also mainly influenced by the seminal work of Lakoff and Johnson. Um, titled conceptual, meta, conceptual Metaphor Theory, that basically suggests that metaphors can be considered a tool that enables people to use what they know about their direct physical and social experiences to understand more abstract things like work, time, mental activity, and feelings. The work of metaphors uh, related to digital uh, trends was also enriched by more recent works, such as the one provided by Wai who noted that the relevance of metaphors on the internet is not only evocative and political, since, they, uh, since metaphors also suggest something about them, I'm quoting here, here, how the actors who use metaphors understand the physical and materiality of new media. For the mother, con uh, metaphors can also have used through a cognitive function and can be seen through a pragmatic view carrying positive or ne negative connotations on a particular agent or phenomenon, both in a direct or indirect way, according to the work of Cartier Black. Finally, the strategic role uh, played by metaphors uh, it can be considered, according to Octavian works, as a selective process, according to which metaphors highlight some feature of a perceived reality obscuring others. When it comes to the reality, um, the, 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 the study of uh, metaphor in relation to the Chinese internet, according to a more Chinese perspective in terms of Chinese uh, academic publication, well, uh, it's interesting to note how one of the very few articles on this uh, on this specific trend was uh, published a couple of years ago by our colleague Chen Chuxin, who basically try to identify the evolution okay, of metaphors uh, in relation to the Chinese internet uh, from 1994 to 2022. So the main findings of this article were many two. There are two main fi findings. The first one is that at the present stage, the debate, uh, the academic debate on the role of metaphors on the Chinese, related to the Chinese internet is not very well developed. And uh, most of the metaphors are uh, have direct have a very direct connotation with have, have a very limited connotation with Chinese language and culture, whereas is very very influenced by America cultural media books and uh, academic discussion. The second findings is uh, from historical perspective, and one of the very very first uh, researcher who uh, apply uh, develop. Um, a study on the relation between the Chinese the evolution of the Chinese internet and the metaphor was Professor Hu Yong from Peking University with an article published in 2015. What is surprising here, and actually this work is basically in line with the previous, with the first funding of Chen Chuxin article. Indeed, in this article, we note that the main relevance to the application of metaphors were, 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 were linked, is linked to um, very uh, important masterpiece of the um, American um, literature, such as The Metaphor We Live By, No Romancer, Programming by the World Wide Web, Virtual Community, of course, McLuhan, uh, Understanding Media. 
So uh, this is just uh, the table that I retrieved from, from the article. As you can note, there are very, very limited uh, uh, connection to the um, um, Chinese language, Chinese culture, from uh, uh, the use of uh, metaphors to the evolution of the Chinese uh, internet. So what I basically did is to, uh, for, for this essay, is just to uh, identify um, the very first uh, period of the Chinese internet, uh, and which goes from 1994 to 2003, and try to identify the most relevant metaphors that have been developed uh, during, during that period. This choice was uh, uh, justified, this is, again, inspired by another article by Chen Yangrong and Cao Yue, who um, basically already provide this kind of, 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 of kind of analysis. And uh, the reason why I choose for I, I, decided, I decided to go on this direction is basically because I was also inspired by the uh, theoretical framework of Paul Star and its constitutive choices, uh, according to which uh, a process that said that a, a, the, the, the very first year, the very first moment, the period of a particular medium sets the process uh, and the condition for the future development of a particular institution. Or media. The second reason is that, uh, paradoxically, um, during the first year of the Chinese internet, uh, the evolution of important metaphors, as well as the needs and ambition of the government, the business sector, and the so-called national civil society, were paradoxically more visible and accessible. But in more general terms, the history of the Chinese internet in China can be seen as a process in which different social actors, such as national government, market, civil society, image and generate this core practice. So basically, my essay tried to propose three different periods that uh, um, highlight uh, different metaphors, which basically reflect uh, the role of the government, of the business and society. So starting with the very first period, which basically reflects the the, the role of the government. To, well, one of the very first metaphors was uh, that they recall the history of the Chinese internet uh, recalls the Prometheus myth of stealing fire, Huo, symbolizing the access to new technologies supported by a more liberal internationalized environment. The idea of cosmopolitanism is visible also, um, it is pretty present in a clear in the metaphor expressed in the very first object. The email was that was sent, which was sent uh, in uh, 1989, and um, across the great wall, the great wall, we can reach every uh, every corner of the world. It's interesting to note that the reference to the great wall can have more than a just single interpretation. If, from the Chinese perspective, the Chinese great wall was considered a symbol of humiliation, humiliation in modern history, to be put behind also through the technological process, well. From uh, a Western perspective, the reference to the Great Wall was used to coin the new Great Firewall metaphor. And uh, I'm quoting here the article published on Wired by Jeremy Barmet in 1997. Uh, Great Firewall was basically a metaphor that to um, express the digital equivalent of China's Great Wall and designed to keep Chinese cyberspace free of all, of all sorts. So this is the first period. Come to the second period. Well, as Jun um, Yu um, already elaborated in his very first uh, uh, presentation of today, the internet in China cannot be considered as monolithic. Indeed, it also includes other forces. And the other very important, the very, the very important uh, contribution of the other, other agent is, of course, provided by the private sector. Indeed, the sec this second stage includes the import and the elaboration of other metaphors, again, mainly imported by the US. One of the most interesting uh, concrete examples in this sense is the information superhighway, coined by Hal Grove, but also the reference to the wave, um, mainly influenced by the publication of Alvin Toffler, the third wave published in 1980. So these two metaphors basically reinforce the relevance of speed in the process of technological process, as well as the need of an infrastructure that could assure the success of the internet. But while in the US, the metaphor of the highway was most linked to the, a political discourse, in China, it was mainly related to the private action. I have other couple of examples to support this, this trend. 
Um, this phenomenon, indeed, this phenomenon can be confirmed by one of the very first and iconic advertisements of the Chinese near the internet place near Zhongguanzu, the Zhongguanzu area. The famous slogan, how far are the Chinese people from the information highway? 1,500 um, meters to the north. This advertisement was realized by Zheng Shuixin, one of the first entrepreneurs in the Chinese internet market, whose company was named um, Hing Highway, so information highway, a basic, basically a very um, clear um, transliteration from, 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 uh, from, from the English word. Moreover, the promotion and the popularization of the internet as a super, super information superhighway was also supported by the private sector, but, and, but, but also with other metaphors such as knowledge feeders, um, and eventually internet heroes, Xiong. Basically, this metaphor was associated to entrepreneurs such as Zhang Chaoyang, Wang Jindong, and Ding Lei who founded the Sohu, Sina, and Ed Hayes. So these metaphors basically can, mm, can, can be viewed as a contribution to promote the Chinese internet development, not only as a state-driven action, but also supported by the private initiative. Going to the, the last, uh, the third set of metaphors, well, of course, the popularization and the commercialization of the, of, of, of the internet in China led to a third stage of metaphors more focused on internet users and, and, and society in more general terms. The success of Second Life in particular supported the shift from the idea of information um, highway to a metaphor, according to Chen and Tao, uh, defined as a, for a way of being. So, of course, the, this, the evolution of the Chinese market and the experience of, the, of, of Second Life in particular led to a proliferation of online games and virtual spaces, as demonstrated by the success of the video games industry in, the, in, the, in, the, in this third stage. But this private inaction, the private inaction led to a kind of reaction from the government that, uh, um, not by coincidence, used another metaphors to try to balance the, 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 the contribution. Uh, one of the most, one, one of the most important uh, metaphors in this sense was the one of electronic heroin, okay, against heroin, just to identify the effects abuse of online games among young generation and young users. But in more general terms, and again in line with the previous works of Yang Wobin, uh, Hai Qingyu, um, the success of video games um, was also followed by the evolution of other virtual spaces, okay, uh, Web 2.0 um, um, services such as uh, BBS, blogs, and microblogs. All these uh, virtual spaces were associated to the spatial, spatial metaphor, such as squares, homes, jianghu, or in more general terms, the idea of one uh, Shichi, network community. This phenomenon, this set of metaphors, set, basically set the shift from the individual life experience of seven life to a more complex complex net of relationships based on individual responsibilities that have, have an effect on the creation of virtual, virtual, of virtual specific virtual worlds. So uh, coming to the, the, the conclusion of, and the to analysis of these three, three, three different stages, uh, uh, we can basically argue that as Hal Wyatt already noted, the, um, metaphors cannot, are not only under the unique domains of poets, but their creation also involves scientists, engineers, designers, policymakers, and of course, politicians. For another, the analysis of the Chinese internet metaphors can support our understanding of the construction of social imaginaries, as well as influence the global digital trends in the evolution of, uh, in relating the evolution of the Chinese internet. So, identify the agent, the contribute already contributed and still influence the import and or the creation of specific metas, metaphors can be useful to measure the intention of specific groups. Finally, and in line with the need, with the goal of uh, this workshop to have a retrospective loop on the Chinese internet, another way to identify political, economic, and social agents 
who influence and develop different, different digital trends can be to analyze the evolution of specific metaphors, which from time to time can disappear, emerge or re-emerge according to the specific goals of the same of different agents and players. So this is basically all from my side and I hope that to, to, to develop our discussion in the Q&A section. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Negro from uh, Siena University. Next up is uh, Dr. De Seto from University of Bergen. Yes. Hello. <clears throat> uh, just checking. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. Very happy to contribute to this. Um, so my presentation today is titled uh, From ASCII Lanterns to Synthetic Live Streams, uh, Three Decades of Chinese Digital Folklore. So this is uh, it's a very short <clears throat> version of the essay I wrote um, for the issue. And uh, it summarizes um, the main topic of my uh, PhD research and something I've been researching for around 10 years. Um, and this topic is what I call digital folklore. And uh, I kind of do an overview of what happened in the past 30 years um, of the Chinese internet and other kinds of digital media. So um, before I start with the, the overview, um, I, I thought that uh, this topic is actually quite uh, under-researched and uh, there's very little written on it, often very uh, minor articles or quite unknown books and, and essays, uh, because uh, most of the discussion about the internet in China has often revolved around uh, quantitative data about development and adoption and growth of infrastructure or other kind of uh, um, sort of internet related products. There's a lot of discussion about the Chineseness or not of the Chinese internet. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about everyday use, uh, internet cafes, mobile phones, uh, live streaming. And of course, there's a lot of attention on the uh, both governmental and private um, companies role in developing the internet. And I think in all, all this discussion are obviously very important, um, but uh, there is something also to be said about the more creative, uh, underrepresented, often ignored uh, sides of the internet um, that uh, I think now people are starting to pay attention to them, especially in news media and popular culture. But uh, I think scholarship has also the duty to discuss these things. So uh, the main concept that I use in this essay and that I've developed uh, <clears throat> in my research is that of uh, digital folklore. And uh, you can kind of imagine what it means. It's the the sort of uh, folklore, folk art, uh, everyday creativity that develops on digital media. Uh, and I take this concept from this book by a couple of artists, artists and researchers, um, Olia Lili and Dragon Espenshid. But more broadly, between cultural studies and anthropology and social sciences, uh, a lot of people have discussed concepts like vernacular creativity, uh, like Gene Burgess. So the, this idea of creativity that happens in everyday life through uh, amateur media practices. And there's also been discussions of the electronic vernacular. So the sort of uh, folk languages that develop through, through computers. Uh, someone else has brought about cyber folk art and digital folklore is eventually the concept that I adopt because I think it's the most uh, broad and all encompassing. And a definition here would be something like the customs, traditions, and elements of visual, textual, and audio culture that emerged from users' engagement with personal computers and applications. So when people encounter computers and digital media, they make up culture, they make up folklore, they make up stories, they make up uh, characters and, and languages. And I want to study what how this works and what happened in three decades of the Chinese internet. So um, we have discussed this email at length, uh, the first email sent from China to the world. 
Um, but I think that uh, from the beginning of the Chinese internet, uh, there has been a lot of uh, creative use of uh, media. So starting from email, obviously, the, that's an example of a very institutional one, um, celebrating an infrastructural linkage. But I think it's another email from 1995 that shows how people adopted this emerging medium for their creative uses. So I'm sure you all know this email. It's the, the email that a bunch of students uh, sent when uh, Zhu Ling was poisoned um, at Beijing University. And I think this is a very good example of how vernacular creativity happens. Uh, so email was one of the few communication medium available at the time, and the students adopted it to do some kind of crowdsourced information uh, gathering to get help uh, for their classmate. So this is perhaps uh, a counterpart to the official uh, across the Great Wall, we can reach every corner of the world email. This is a much more personal and uh, interesting adoption of a medium for, um, for uh, useful purposes. Um, <clears throat> also, we need to remember that in the beginning of the internet, early 90s, um, uh, there were not even Chinese characters uh, encoded in ASCII. So uh, early Chinese users of email and discussion boards had to develop and sort of uh, uh, create uh, local cultural inflections to express things like New Year's greetings or uh, uh, other kinds of holiday messages or uh, traditional uh, representations like, I don't know, uh, the lantern you see here. These are all taken from an article by uh, Kozar in 1995. And, and she uh, did one of the earliest ethnographies of um, uh, digital folklore in China by analyzing how students use these kind of ASCII compositions to share in a sort of, uh, one of the earliest example of a Chinese internet culture in a time when Chinese language was not even available to type. And uh, we can see how this changed uh, on discussion boards or BBSs, like uh, the Suimu Tsinghua board, uh, Tsinghua University one, which has been one of the most popular ones for, for years, um, where uh, in the beginning, Chinese characters were not available. And then when new encodings uh, became available, like the Guo Biao one, um, Chinese characters appeared. Uh, but still, people were using this kind of ASCII compositions to to write uh, in Chinese and, and create a sort of you know, very local image. Uh, the 90s were also the time when Chinese uh, internet users developed uh, digital folklore on the web by creating web pages, uh, home pages, and just like their Western counterparts, they used stock backgrounds and animated GIFs, but they also developed local ones. So you can see here one example of a welcome uh, sign with a door and the flying written, written on it. Um, and there were uh, a lot of uh, early Chinese websites uh, where Chinese culture and folklore were articulated by people just creating, uh, I don't know, gifts of dragons and immortals and, and explaining Chinese culture to, to the world. Uh, it's interesting to see how these early websites uh, that are very clearly examples of uh, the digital folklore described in uh, the Lielina and Aspen Sheet book, uh, directly connect to the history of the internet in China. So these are a couple of screenshots from a, a website called China Pages, which was a translation agency established in, in uh, Hangzhou by a, a guy called Jack Ma. Uh, this is his first website that he made before uh, it became what we today know as one of the largest Chinese internet companies. Uh, so this is how um, uh, China Pages looked. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see uh, how, at that time, being a webmaster meant creating this sort of uh, Chinese-looking uh, web design elements to uh, promote, in this case, the, the uh, business of, of ChinaPages.com. Uh, <clears throat> then, after websites, uh, these Chinese internet companies started uh, creating portals, which look like this. And uh, with portals, the possibilities for interaction became more structured, and users did not have to build their own web pages. They could just use uh, services like email and discussion boards provided by companies like NetEase or Sohu or Sina. And uh, 
So the creativity, digital folklore moved into these uh, more regulated spaces. So this is one example of a uh, Baidu Teba board, uh, the Iba one, the Iba, one of the most famous uh, uh, discussion boards where a lot of internet culture was created uh, in the 2000s. And it's interesting, as you can see, that one of the uh, the slogan of Deepa is Yuan Chuan Jinsen, so the, the spirit of original creations. Uh, so encouraging users and recognizing how uh, one of the main purposes of a discussion board like the Deepa is to create original internet culture. And Gao Zhui here is another important term, uh, as we will see, because um, uh, there are very uh, local examples of digital folklore like Ega culture emerging in this kind of spaces. Uh, this is also the 2000s are also the time where uh, service like QQ, Tencent's QQ became very popular, offering uh, uh, another kind of social arena for people's creativity to develop. So QQ was a messaging uh, software and people could just chat and use emoticons, but also uh, develop their own stickers or, or, or purchase uh, sticker sets. And uh, as you can see here in the Biaoqing DIY on the bottom left, uh, this was a very important uh, tool through which people created a lot of different stickers and sticker packs that became the foundation for uh, a lot of Chinese visual internet culture uh, that would become popular in the following decades. And QQ was also uh, expanding uh, into a more social service through uh, services like QZone, where people could basically build a blog or their own personal homepage and decorate it through uh, avatars and backgrounds that they they could purchase and exchange with QQ coins. So in this in the in the two thousands, uh, we can see how digital folklore becomes embraced by these emerging platform companies like Tencent and monetized. So something that people used to do for their own amusement becomes slowly something to be packaged and sold and integrated into uh, software like QQ. Uh, and also in the 2000s, especially late, mid to late 2000s, uh, we see uh, the first web 2.0 services emerging. So uh, websites like Douban or Sina Weibo or Fanfo, Yoku um, are all uh, similar to the portals that preceded them, but uh, they are much more based on UGC or user generated content. So in this period, the uh, commercialization of digital folklore becomes uh, an actual business model. All these platforms want users to create stuff. They want users to create videos and upload them to, to create viral content, to post uh, stuff that gets retweeted. So uh, in a way, uh, digital folklore becomes uh, 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 a good uh, of value for, this, uh, for these companies. And uh, this is why UGC and creativity were so central to the Web 2.0 era. And this is the era when we see the most, uh, the earliest recognized examples of Chinese digital folklore emerging. Uh, I just put a couple here that everybody knows that have been written about uh, a lot of times in in, in academic uh, scholarship. The the backdoor uh, backdoor boys who uploaded videos of themselves uh, lip singing to to famous songs, and the uh, bloody case caused by Steam Ban by Huga, which was one of the earliest example of what has been known as Uga. So a very Chinese uh, uh, sort of genre of what today we call internet memes, um, but with a very specific uh, quality of parody and um, irony and making fun of cultural products uh, through uh, various kinds of wordplay or uh, mockery. So this is a time where uh, the emphasis on user-generated content uh, on the web 2.0 services uh, gives rise to a clearly recognized Wanruo or internet culture. So this is a time when um, internet culture has become sort of, if not institutionalized, at least widely recognized, even in, in Chinese news uh, and in popular discussion. <clears throat> and in the 2010s, with the release of apps like WeChat, uh, and as we get closer to the 2020s with uh, more uh, video-based and uh, social media apps like uh, Douyin or Xiaohongshu, we move towards uh, 
a massive shift that is created by the um, uh, shift turn to mobile, both mobile devices and mobile internet access. So when the Chinese internet becomes unmoored from the web and from web-based services and from uh, laptops and computers, and it moves towards uh, smartphones with their new affordances like smartphone cameras and various uh, content making apps. This is another uh, quite important period uh, in which Chinese digital folklore changes and adapts to these uh, new platforms that have now hundreds of millions of users uh, throughout China. So uh, just to give you a couple of examples, we see the persistence of uh, previous genres of content like the, the Biaoqing or stickers and Biaoqing Bao that are now fully commercialized on, pla on platforms like WeChat, where every user can set up their own store and, and sell or buy uh, stickers. But also uh, they become uh, widespread and as a collected item uh, from WeChat users, since you can create your own stickers and personalize them and save them across conversations. Um, and, and these stickers become a, a true um, form of uh, popular culture with their own uh, series and genres and, and characters and protagonists. And you could almost write a whole uh, book about the folklore of uh, WeChat stickers. And another example uh, coming from uh, live streaming or short video apps is that of uh, specific aesthetics that develop um, in Chinese digital folklore. So for example, these are some uh, screenshots from uh, videos that are known as Tu Wei, uh, rural flavor um, video edits that are popular on, on video sharing apps like uh, Kuaishou or Douyin, uh, in which people that are mostly coded as coming from rural areas or uh, uh, second or third or fourth tier cities, create animations um, that are quite uh, colorful and kitschy. And uh, these are quite unique um not only to China, but also to specific apps and specific user bases. And as you can see on the left uh, image, uh, these are also uh, dis widely discussed by comments that people leave on the videos and the whole uh, discussion of the aesthetics and of the provenance of the video becomes in itself a way of making culture and making digital folklore about uh, these apps. And uh, uh, I would conclude by uh, giving some uh, future speculations about uh, where digital folklore is headed. So on the one hand, we see that uh, digital folklore has become part of everyday discussions and of, uh, you know, even of popular culture in China to the point that terms that develop uh, online uh, becomes adopted, become adopted in everyday life and even discussed abroad as symptoms of um, uh, cultural developments in China. These are just a couple of examples, but Tangping or Neijuan are both uh, terms that emerge from digital folklore, so from people making up uh, an internet language and uh, using it on, on digital media. But uh, they are so widespread and uh, intertwined with China's social context that uh, we now think of them as integral part of Chinese culture. So uh, on the one hand, we can see that digital folklore becomes, in a way, just Chinese culture uh, or uh, part of Chinese everyday life, uh, and, and it becomes of broad societal relevance. On the other, uh, as you can see in this example, these are all uh, defects or synthetically generated uh, influencers live streaming. So uh, new uh, forms of creativity that are not necessarily uh, entirely made by humans become a uh, part of uh, uh, creative practices online, like live streaming or selling or merchandising or becoming an influencer. And so we also need to look at how new algorithmic actors start to play a role in process of, processes of creativity. Uh, it's not just Chinese users that make memes that becomes influencers or that uh, create new languages, but uh, systems like recommendation engines or uh, face recognition algorithms or uh, machine learning models, they will become part of this emerging uh, uh, creative practices. So these are a couple of trends that I um, highlight in my essay and I think will become relevant in the next few years. 
but overall, my uh, my contribution is just uh, sort of a history, short history of how digital folklore changed over three decades of the Chinese internet. And I haven't been keeping track of time, so I'll just end here. Hope I didn't go too much over it. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deseta. Uh, that's from uh, University of Bergen. Uh, speaking next uh, is uh, Professor Florence Schneider from uh, Leiden University. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am not going to share my screen. I'm just going to chat with you a little bit about the uh, content of this article that I've put together for you. Uh, thank you for including me in this. It gave me a chance to reflect a bit on my own work on nationalism, on popular nationalism, specifically digital forms of nationalism, uh, and to ask how the rise of popular nationalism has coincided with the uh, the introduction and then the expanse of internet technologies. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So um, let me talk a little bit with you about um, why this article is going in the direction of, of conceptualizing, thinking a little bit about mutual, uh, like multiple nationalisms, plural, uh, so that there's not just a single nationalism, but uh, many different nationalisms in China. And you'll recognize the parallels, I think, to uh, Liu Jun's talk earlier about how we should talk about multiple internets as well. And I think that's then also one of the reasons why we see this very fragmented uh, understanding of what the Chinese nation might be today. So uh, when I say nationalism, what I mean is uh, the construction of a group sentiment yeah, and constructed either through communication or social practices or both. So there's often quite a bit of ritual work involved, uh, but very frequently, think of Benedict Anderson, right? The uh, exchange and the circulation of symbols plays a great role in how groups come together. Uh, and that's also why so many of my colleagues have recently been writing about tribalism. I've also uh, taken a stab at that topic, neo-tribalism, uh, anywhere really in the uh, internets, uh, but certainly in China. And so one of those group sentiments is that of the nation, the idea that this national, this imagined community of the nation should be at the center of any kind of modern political activity, certainly at the center of political autonomy, so sovereignty, but also at the center of mobilization and various kinds of actions. So that's the starting point of how to think of nationalism. And um, in China, we see an initial uh, really dominance of state-led, top-down nationalism. You could go as far back, I suppose, as the 19th century for that, uh, the combination of elites, um, of intellectuals, and then state power coming together to shape what the nation is, uh, certainly also under Mao. But the real kickoff for the kind of nationalism we witness now, so I'm not going to go that far back, uh, is really the, yeah, the last 30 years or so, roughly starting in the 80s and certainly taking on steam after 1989, the events there, the fall of the Soviet Union and the understanding for the Chinese Communist Party that something needs to glue together uh, the Chinese public in order to be actually viable uh, as a political space and for the CCP to legitimate itself as the uh, single ruler of uh, that territory. And so in order to achieve that, um, the CCP effectively rediscovered patriotism as a tool, nationalism as a tool, and communicated that through patriotic education campaigns uh, and propaganda to the point where at this point now, uh, it's a ubiquitous reference system for anyone who wants to position themselves in any kind of public debate in China to varying degrees. I mean, there's certain things you can probably get away with talking about without referencing the nation, but it is a such a useful touchstone uh, that has also become uh, immensely commercialized uh, and plugged in by all sorts of commercial actors in order to say things that are just about safe and within the mainstream, uh, but while also being attractive to audiences. Now, this is not quite what we saw, I think, in the early uh, phases of the rollout of the internet, what we might call Web 1.0, uh, where uh, we had dedicated spaces of people coming together, often uh, folks who were tech savvy enough to do that in the early internets, uh, to create websites uh, and web forums. Uh, you might recall the BBS uh, trends at the time, like the Strong Country Forum, which uh, Yang Gobin has also written about. So, Tiangguo uh, Luntan, right? Um, and uh, later on, websites like Anti CNN. Uh, and also blogs that targeted often the United States, but also other perceived uh, enemies of the nation outside uh, forces, usually still in this context of uh, trying to challenge imperialism uh, and challenging uh, slights against the nation. So a very uh, important moment was 1999 with the anti-NATO protests uh, after the bombing of the Chinese embassy uh, during the war. So that's uh, effectively the 1.0 uh, setup from which 
nationalism then grows into something much more diverse uh, when the Web 2.0 facilities of social media um, uh, accommodate a much broader uh, range of interactions. And then also the state, uh, I, I dare, dare I call it backlash, maybe that's not the right word, but intervention, right? state interventions into trying to quote unquote guide uh, public opinion and uh, calibrate what happens in these networks, channel, channel, uh, channeling them further into uh, walled gardens and networks that can be better controlled. Uh, what that will mean for Web 3.0 uh, developments is still a bit hard to say, so still very much TBD, but we're looking at new kinds of e-commerce for sure uh, with crypto and blockchain uh, possibilities, uh, the Internet of Things uh, becoming more commonplace, but also AI and personal app experiences, which might channel people further even into those walled gardens that already somewhat exist. And I think we uh, can relate the debates that then uh, will shape our understanding of group sentiments in these uh, environments very much to the work that folks like uh, Corey Doctorow have done, talking about the, excuse my language here, the end shittification of platforms. So platforms have become shittier and shittier, as it were, which is what we see with YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and uh, processes that we then also see uh, in other places like China, uh, but also the question of whether or not the uh, much evoked filter bubbles that Paris wrote about, or the what is now called filter worlds. Uh, Kyle Chaika just wrote a book about this. Uh, whether these filter worlds uh, will become even stronger uh, in the face of more personalized experiences. Uh, so where are we at then? Uh, ultimately, in the diversity of different demographics that promote nationalist ideas and nationalist narratives and how diverse those then get. Uh, there are, on the one hand, uh, the sort of disgruntled older men. Uh, these are the kind of people who I saw qualitatively in my own research uh, doing nationalist work, uh, but also some of the survey earlier survey work by people like Johnson show that um, older men are a particular cohort that generates nationalism. And we have uh, the, the angry youths, also mostly male young people. Uh, this is sort of uh, Rosen's discussion of angry youths, right? Uh, but uh, more recently, we see uh, there too uh, more urban educated, often female audiences flocking to nationalism. I'm still interested to see how, how the research on this plays out, uh, particularly uh, about the Little Pinks, where we saw earlier uh, analyses of the Little Pink phenomenon showing that actually often it is still men who hijack women's narratives and sell them as diverse when they're really not. Uh, but I think the more recent research shows that there are plenty of uh, women who milk nationalism or patriotism for their own gains. Uh, and then we see a, a range of ideologies that use nationalism as sort of a meta ideology uh, from which they can then plug in uh, their own personal ideological arguments. And uh, I think I saw uh, Han Rombin in the in the chat. Uh, he wrote a really fantastic article about pro and anti she nationalist sentiments around the term limit extension, which I think highlights very nicely how just within the what we might call the right in Europe, but in China is more like the new left, I suppose. Uh, within that uh, seemingly small range of ideological positions, you still have very different ideas of nationalism and what the nation is about. And that's true on, in that corner um, of the internet. And how much is it, of course, true elsewhere when we bring liberals in or you know rural audiences and all these kind of different uh, users and people who uh, make sense of the nation. Uh, one other important uh, development that I wanted to highlight in this article uh, is the new mobilization strategies that we've seen over the last, I would say, about decade or so. Um, again, tie very much to Web 2.0 technologies and to uh, the capitalist promotion of idols in China, the fandom cultures that have emerged. And there's a whole bunch of people who've written uh, eloquently about uh, how fandom practices, and some, to some extent, start mirroring the kind of group sentiments we see with nationalism. Uh, Liu Hailong has written a really fantastic uh, edited volume. Uh, I don't think Wei Yu Zhang is here right now, but Wei Yu has uh, also written about a network publics, plural, uh, in uh, the context of fandom publics. And there's a whole lot of exciting PhD research coming out. Keep your eyes peeled for light and stuff. I can already, you know, a uh, little spoiler alert, but we have some folks here who are working on, uh, on, on popular fandom cultures and how they relate uh, to the mobilization that we now see with nationalists. And so there's a couple of lessons that I think we can take away from these last 30 plus years uh, of popular nationalism and internet development. One is that the state continues to play a major role both as a discourse creator, it is still um, one of the institutions, probably the, the major institutions that inject uh, inject symbols into the communication processes about the nation, but also as a regulator, and not necessarily as a top-down 
um, authoritarian regulator, though it has those powers, but often as what my colleague Rogier Kremers calls a strategic nexus as a, um, a meta network uh, that sets the boundaries within which politics then happens and in which uh, private actors in particular then uh, give meaning to the idea of the nation and to national interactions. Uh, and that's the, the second big takeaway, and that's that capitalist commercial actors play a, a large role, particularly platform providers, but also other um, like e-commerce providers, uh, app creators, uh, who are trying to calibrate the attention economy in a way that captures eyeballs. And in that context, uh, certain kinds of narratives sell better than others, and nationalism is one of those. Uh, and that connects uh, forcefully to the third point, which is about algorithmic and interface powers or interface effects uh, that uh, ultimately, in the way that we've now organized our internets, not just in China, uh, tend to flatten cultural expressions to the lowest common denominator, uh, because that is what gets the most clicks. And in China, that again includes a uh, backdrop of cultural assumptions that are grounded in uh, yeah, several decades of patriotic education and nationalist uh, propaganda. So the question uh, is then not so much whether digital technologies will, quote unquote, disrupt nationalist narratives or the nation, uh, the way that we talked about these things in the 90s, I think that uh, we've moved on, right? Uh, but it is very much about what kind of nationalism of these many nationalisms uh, will emerge as the mainstream, as the new mainstream, and as the broadest touchstone for the broadest number of people, and what that will do both to politics in China, but also to the rest of the world, as uh, these nationalisms reach out and influence and shape uh, politics and political interactions elsewhere. So I'm going to stop here. I look forward to the discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florin, um, from Leiden University. Uh, speaking next is uh, Dino, Dr. Dino Zhang from uh, University of Hong Kong, City University of Hong Kong. Okay, uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes, working, okay. working well. Okay, okay, so, um, sorry, just uh, going to go back to the beginning of the slides. So the, the title is, uh, my presentation is uh, The Membranes, A Decade of Game Studies in China in, re re in Retrospect. It's not exactly uh, reviewing the decade of game studies, uh, and also, I mean, not Chinese game studies, but also um, in this sense, I'm looking at uh, at sort of uh, at both directions, uh, game studies in China, uh, in terms of Chinese academia, but also um, um, English uh, uh, papers or publications written about um, um, games culture in China. So in this sense, what I'm doing here is not necessarily um, an uh, intellectual review, but um, looking at it as an example on um, how we can learn from this intellectual history in the past decade. Uh, in this sense, where I have uh, had a very lot of personal experience in this field, uh, in that sense, it's also in a sort of abstract view of um, this intellectual history. So I'll just uh, read um, my essay uh, that I did for, uh, prepared for this workshop. Um, so from, to start, sort of, I want to sort of uh, going uh, through some of the um, um, works that uh, that is being sort of acknowledged that the um, the works that we've been done in the past decade um, there has been both a lot of English language game studies about China and Chinese language game studies in mainland China itself have both grown in size and intellectual cohesion um, in English. Um, sorry, in English that. Um, there are two special issues um, that are both included here in screenshots. Um, um, one edited volume um, um, published uh, recently and uh, uh, another book, uh, a monograph. Um, and there are many also many, many, many um, um, standalone essays, uh, uh, excellent standalone essays. And um, in Chinese, there's also been uh, quite a few books published, but I'll only mention three books that I think are quite important um, seminal works. And first one is the, um, um, the Introduction to Chinese Game Studies published recently. It's also edited volume. There's also um, two books. Um, one is called Logology, and the other one is called um, The History of Chinese uh, Games. And there is also uh, sort of a, um, a series of, of, of essays 
uh, a running series of video game criticism uh, called Yoshi Learn, published by uh, the paper uh, since 2019. Um, what I'm doing here is really the essay or the, or the talk, per se, is not necessarily um, um, a retrospect uh, on the intellectual development uh, uh, of Chinese language game studies in China, no English game studies in, on China, but the intellectual membrane between them. And I must apologize in advance for the omission of a celebrated tone as an incisive is given priority in this short talk. And this reflection is not necessarily directed at game studies per se. If so, um, I would choose another venue. Uh, but um, um, but the various kind of processes of knowledge um, 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 production uh, on China and in China, in this sense, the, phenom uh, the phenomenon um, discussed here is valuable to the intersecting fields of China studies and internet studies. And a decade ago, I used to think digital games as an object of study were viewed from different lines of sight, um, presumably due to different social economic concerns, cultural histories, ethnological priorities in China and the West, and therefore resulting in parallax views oblivious of each other. For a reason, uh, and, 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 and for, for, um, with the power of uh, hindsight instead of a parallax shift, I now conjecture the membranes probably a better metaphor to highlight the gatekeeping of scholarship as they are translated, translocated, and even transplanted. And what ideas, fetish theories, emergent areas and objects of study are strategically selected to pass through in either direction uh, between China and object or area of study or China's native sphere of scholarship. So um, extending from the broader cultural industries, um, uh, broader cultural industries of film and literature, exporting academic knowledge, manufacturing in China is seen as integral uh, part of the larger project of telling the Chinese story as well. The top level strategy uh, would be as uh, John advocates, cultural confidence and proactive, this is my own translation, um, cultural confidence and proactive translation of Chinese texts into foreign languages and Chinese, Chinese scholars would transcend from reciting or even rehearsing others, i.e. the West, to speaking in one's own words. These instructions in themselves do sound very subversive and even admirable. However, what is slightly strange here is the conspicuous lack of acknowledgement of post-colonial theory, which has articulated very similar issues very well. But maybe the pessimist tone of colonial studies is not very compatible with the buoyant mood of nationalism. But I digress. Within the efforts of translate, uh, uh, efforts to translate Chinese literature, uh, Dylan Navin King observes the glaring differences between the best or best rated, according to popular opinions in China, uh, fi ch uh, uh, best rated ch uh, fiction work, and the sorts of literary works bankrolled by Chinese publisher and state bodies, and the raw core of Chinese to English translations by Paper Republic a UK-based organization focused on bringing Chinese writing to the world. So in comparison to literature, game study sphere of influence is minuscule and very few texts has been translated from Chinese. And it's questionable that the Chinese state, state agencies are even aware of the field. However, a similar disparity of concurrent con but not intersecting sets of concerns can still be observed, uh, even among Firstly, the competing camps of scholarship within China, or to pull it very colloquially, uh, San Tojui, literally mountain stronghold mentality, a specific sectarianism emerged uh, from the Yan uh, rectification movement. And second, those who are looking for gold nuggets, i.e. Uh, ethnographic particularities in China, uh, uh, for the non-Chinese audience, uh, that includes myself. Um, for the first kind of, for the first category, and um, and given how small uh, uh, game studies in China and how recent uh, the field has gained the momentum in public discourse, 
this sectarianism is not a result of intellectual debate, but very explicit exploits of um, uh, opportunism and coalism in the pursuit of who has planted the flag first in the game studies and who can claim expertise before the various social economic and political bodies from the likes of Tencent, NetEase, and State itself. David Graeber has summarized this factionism very well, as he writes, all factions come to interested primarily in grabbing hold a small piece of intellectual territory as the basis for developing increasingly administrative oriented professional careers. Apart from the membership in uh, international organizations, one way to achieve this domestic validation in China is via foreign translation of their works, and this is mainly subject to the availability of funding sources to pay the publishers and translators. Having little impact outside of China does not affect the main purpose of constructing a respectable, a respectable front for a domestic audience. Quality of scholarship is likely not given priority in this membrane configuration. And secondly, for those of us working outside of China, the role has been relegated to explaining China and its very alien game industry and culture um, as the unquestionable uh, vindication of its scholarly value. This membrane uh, configuration is preoccupied with the business of understanding China from the perspective of Euro-American theories, while claiming the novelty lies in the deviation or displacement from Euro Eurocentrism. After the mystical figure of gold farmers was discovered by Gurdjieff in 2006, it is not difficult to see how the misalignment between, say, uh, Lakamura's uh, 2009 Association of the History of Labor Racism in America with gold farmers and field research in China with the actual gold farmers who have their own concerns and which may risk another layer of, of Orientalism in, in itself. What is missing here is not leveraging navel-gazing accusations of Orientalism itself, um, but a seemingly impervious division of labor in knowledge production uh, between those who are grounded in realities via fieldwork or industry experience and those who are theorists who produce knowledge by the philosophical speculation and rereading history. So um, in that sense, the Western academics uh, are likely to humanize gold farmers by expecting their struggles against the presupposed alienation as, um, as Tuan Hui, who recently wrote, Western critiques position micro workers as robotic, both because their work a narrative that in, in, instead privilege express expressive, skillful, or meaningful forms of work. Though how that is defined is heavily biased. This membrane configuration is of another order, not of opportunism or social capital like the first category, but of divided intellectual labor and the compulsion to look for the suffering subject. If utilized properly, Translation could have helped with the broader circulation of theoretical knowledge, uh, theoretical knowledge, um, and uh, 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 and local interpretations. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, translation could have helped the broader circulation of theoretical exchange and multi-sided interpretations, and offset the divide. Um, uh, uh, since the theoretical production and local inter interpretation do exist in Chinese language, for example, the aforementioned opinion pieces, opinion series of video game criticism are published on the paper. Just good, just as good sinology, uh, such as Simon, Simon Lay's um, work, uh, uh, that, that never falls into a, simply a territory of area-based expertise, but rather universally relevant knowledge and culture critique. And such an intellectual heritage should not be forgotten by us who are writing about China outside of China. Just looking at um, foreign works in, in the past 10 years, how foreign uh, language books, being uh, foreign language books on game studies being translated into Chinese, uh, Sun Jin's 2014 work uh, has basically traced the history of various foreign texts being uh, uh, that's been translated in, in the past uh, tw 20 years. Most of these selections of translated works follow specific intellectual, social, economic, and political climate during a given historical period. Whether the focus was on games, 
uh, pathological or medical or psychological sciences in the 80s, or the debates on the legitimacy of games as workers of art or sports in the 90s or early 2000s. Finally, the new wave of scholarship studying games as cultural media in the past decade. It seems to be, uh, with very few exceptions, the legitimacy of translation in China still lies in the importing by default progressive knowledge according to political needs at the moment. Uh, despite the aforementioned methodological nationalism of speaking, um, um, uh, uh, of speaking in one's own terms, there's a certain section of Chinese scholarship with that credibility fully invested in imposing the latest theoretical turns and new debates, a bit with a bit of delay, just like how French theory travels to the Anglosphere on a domestic audience. The uh, what is usually called the Shushu Banyin Gong, a literally academic baggage handler. Um, in in the sense, the trick of filling the perceived information gap a term that frequently brought out in my conversation with game scholars in China, still works like a charm. And in, in that sense, everyone is kept in their place and for their prospering, uh, prospering careers. Yes, these membrane fun configurations are not unique to game studies nor to China, but we should be alarmed that this intellectual disposition does not necessarily need to genium, uh, does, does not necessarily need to genuine intellectual exchange in either direction. We may still need to reflect upon this condition, firstly because of the grim prospects for future scholarly exchanges in the face of geopolitical, geopolitical tensions and censorship, and secondly because our roles as a scholars in claiming, consolidating, and becoming unnecessarily defensive about our disciplinary territories of knowledge production. The ongoing or forthcoming asthmological crisis is double-sided. It is not simply the issue of resorting to expo exploitive means for careerless reasons, but also the increasing likelihood of elision in intellectually bipolar world. I hope I'm totally wrong. I'll just uh, finish reading the essay. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And um, uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dino Zhang. Uh, we'll we'll get to the uh, Q and A at the end. Uh, we have one last uh, presentation, last but not least, uh, Doctor uh, Zhang Lin. Okay, so let me share my screen first. Can you see my screen there? Cool. Yes. Okay. Yeah, great. So thank you, uh, Gobin, uh, Jingyi, and uh, Jingyi, and Chuan, and and also the co-hosting institutions for um, the invitation to share my work. Uh, I have to say I learned a lot from the speakers tonight, and also uh, in part one in this morning. And as you will see, that uh, my presentation actually will echo a lot of the previous uh, mentioned themes. So um, so in this short presentation, I intend to tell a kind of micro story of the Chinese internet history in the past 30 years from uh, what I call a social reproductive perspective, centering on uh, rural e-commerce and families uh, uh, caught in between the rural urban divide. So, um, but I will tell th th this uh, micro story against the wider currents of the state's rural informatization campaign the Chinese big tech's expansion into the countryside, and also ongoing transformation in urbanization and rural urban integration at this current moment. So the goal here, um, I would say, is to talk about the transformation of the Chinese internet as its, uh, and its users as kind of situated in a broader and dynamically changing socioeconomic context, uh, specific locales, uh, echoing um, kind of uh, previous presentations in the morning about you know importance of uh, locations uh, um, and and also institutions like the family. So and in doing so to try to actually move beyond a kind of techno determinist, individualized and male centric framework in adopting a more materialistic, feminist and substantive uh, substantive uh, substantive approach um, here um, uh, after uh, Polanyi um, to, to study the Chinese internet. So um, for much of its history, as we all know here that China remained a densely populated agrarian society, uh, the era of 
Maoist China from the 1949 uh, to 1976 witnessed socialist mass mobilization, uh, the collectivization of rural labor land, and also the establishment of strict controls over population mobility through um, the so-called hukou system. And these efforts fueled urban industrialization, but also entrenched disparities between rural and urban areas. The return to a more uh, market-oriented and family-based production had kind of temporarily narrowed the gap. Um, and since the early 1990s, however, the deepening of state-led integration into global capitalist regime of accumulation has resulted in a large exodus of rural-born migrant workers into the cities for jobs. And like translocal and transnational workers in their uh, the other parts of the world, many Chinese migrant laborers left their elderly parents and children behind in rural areas, uh, resulting in a significant shift of the kind of reproductive labor responsibilities to the countryside. And the unique hukou system barred uh, rural migrants from enjoying the same social benefits as urban Chinese, as we all know, but it also kind of helped to preserve the collective ownership of land as the basis for rural subsistence living for these uh, migrants. Together, they have rendered uh, this pattern of uh, so-called semi-proletarianization more salient in China, China's kind of mixed and due structured economy. And since the early 2000s, the plight of Chinese villages and the peasant classes has prompted the party state to redress rural urban gap. In addition to a nationwide removal of agriculture taxes in 2006, the state uh, invested into building rural hard infrastructures like running water, electricity, telephone, cable TV, and high speed internet, and also soft infrastructures like basic medical insurance, pension, welfare payments. And notably here, um, the expansion of the internet in rural China was built on the earlier uh, so-called village access projects initiated in the early 1990s by the Ministry of Information Industry and the State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television, which brought telephones and televisions into the Chinese villages. And by uh, 2006, the previous projects and concerns about, uh, about digital divide would uh, were rolled into um, the kind of uh, quote unquote village uh, in informatization program as part of the national campaign to bring broadband to the village and information service to the household. And in comparison to later years of rural informatization championed by homegrown Chinese internet tech, uh, te big techs, as you will hear very soon, this earlier phase of rural internet expansion in the form of village informatization was mostly state-led and subsidized. And despite the state's promotion of rural development, the rural China remained burdened by the responsibility of global labor reproduction without receiving commendable social benefits to sustain this crucial role. And in response, nuclear extended families, um, those split by the rural urban um, uh, migration, emerged as a kind of vital sources for support and buffers against alienation and challenges posed by global capitalism. So the global capitalist crisis of 2008, um, however, brought translocal families and the internet together in facilitating uh, the new parallel trend of reverse migration to the countryside and rural uh, platformization in the form of family incomes. Many migrants who had previously sought opportunities in urban areas, along with a smaller number of rural residents initiated this shift. Um, the initial impetus for this reverse uh, migration can be traced to the closure of export-oriented um, factories along the eastern coast. And these individuals return to their rural roots in search of alternative economic prospects and to fulfill, also fulfill caregiving responsibilities for elderly family members and children. And this return to the countryside actually coincided with the rise of homegrown private technology giants like Alibaba, Jingdong, Pinduoduo, Baidang, and Kuaishou. And these companies um, buoyed by a surge in post-crisis liquidity and also substantial support from both global and Chinese venture capital actually seized upon the reverse migration trend and they harnessed uh, this kind of momentum to drive um, the rapid platformization of rural China throughout the 2010s. So for these migrant returnees and their families, uh, uh, family e-commerce has played a pivotal role in reconnecting previously uh, detached realms of production and reproduction within the family uh, uh, household. 
And this reintegration aims to kind of mitigate the emotional and financial burdens associated with um, China's dual structured economy. And paradoxically, the convergence of people, capital technologies, and state policies, all seeking uh, solutions to the persistent challenges posed by an urban-centric capitalist system, has reshaped the Chinese countryside, uh, reshaped it into a new frontier of digital capitalist accumulation. And this transformation occurs within the broader context of China's mixed economy undergoing significant restructuring. So in my visits to uh, e-commerce villages, I observed how these communities um, you know, either introduce new industries or adapt to existing, often export-oriented production systems to cater to the demands of e-commerce consumption. And consequently, a noble division of labor emerged within these villages, which reflects and contributes to the emergence of new family relationships and also evolving gender roles and identities. So here I would like to borrow anthropologist Yun Xiang Yan's concept of descending familism to help us understand the kind of reconfiguration of power concerning new labor skills across generations. So Yan used the term to describe a kind of rising trend in rural China in which family resources tend to flow downward and existential meaning has shifted from ancestors to uh, grandchildren. And in my re uh, primary research site, uh, w, uh, w Village, which is a handicraft making village in East China, renowned as a Taobao e-commerce village, a typical family e-commerce uh, venture comprised a younger couple, typically ranging from their late 20s to early 40s, whose background varies in terms of prior uh, urban migrant labor experiences. And as my, I document in my um, book, The Labor of Reinvention, the division of labor within couples depended on various factors such as skills, personal preferences, um, personality trends, uh, traits, health conditions, and life stages. And for instance, well, women were generally perceived as better at customer service due to their communication skills. Um, some husbands dedicated equal or even more time to responding to customer inquiries when their wives excelled, for example, in photography, managing relationship with local weavers, or were more occupied with newborns or uh, sick family members. Um, with a significant portion of business conducted online in shared accounts, traditional boundaries between um, private and public spheres began to blur, challenging gender taboos against women participating in work outside of the family in rural China. And in fact, village women I connected with on social media tended actually to be more active in promoting their products and family business virtually. In addition, this business often included their parents, and the most successful of these businesses often grew from pre-existing export-oriented handicraft enterprises owned by the parents themselves. In most families, grandparents in good health um, worked harder than ever before, often without receiving due recognition in exchange for their children's emotional companionship or financial support. Fit seniors typically engage in offline and less technical demanding tasks for the family businesses, such as collecting, storing, packaging, and shipping products. Business also source products from village weavers, compensating them based on piece rates. And these weavers were primarily village women in their late 40s or older, residing in the numerous villages scattered around along the same riverbank as the W village. And they combine their winning responsibilities with the domestic tasks like child rearing, uh, elderly care, cooking, and various household chores. This workforce of uh, home-based house um, weavers consisted mainly of grandmothers who wove out of necessity to mo make ends meet, or because they, um, you know, desired economic self-sufficiency, started to shrink with the rise of e-commerce. Younger women, despite learning how to weave from older family members, often dismissed the idea of becoming professional weavers, viewing the labor as physically demanding and culturally inferior to jobs in the e-commerce uh, sector or even you know, in urban service work. So as the rural living standard improves and demographic uh, changes, different models of rural urban integration are emerging at this moment, um, promote, uh, pr pr prompt, uh, actually prompting debates about the future of Chinese villages, along with it, you know, rural e-commerce and the internet. So just to provide a one perspective here, the ongoing transformation in the e-commerce village W paints a mixed picture. 
uh, e-commerce um, helped enhance raw living standards and re-establish re links between productive and reproductive labor, feeding the aspiration of rural Chinese for a brighter future. However, as family resources and search for a meaningful life trajectory increasingly focus on the well-being of children, the expiration once exclusive to middle-class urban and overseas Chinese to quote-unquote raise the perfect child have begun to permeate rural families. And this descending familism is uh, actually exacerbated by the intensified commodification of rural land, housing, and education since the mid 2010s driven by the state's policy objective of relocating rural uh, residents to nearby town, uh, county seats. So um, starting from the early to 20, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2010s, the central state began redirecting educational resources from township uh, to county seats in a bid to consolidate limited resources. And local county governments heavily relied on real estate development and property value for revenue actually introduced policies linking county public school admission uh, to school district home ownership and the location of children's school registration, particularly since the mid 2010s. And to secure improved education uh, re uh, opportunities for their children, parents in W Village were compelled to invest in county apartments within sought after school district. And this shift led to a real estate boom in the county seat mirroring developments in many other small towns across China. However, this intensified commodification of essential institutions such as schools and housing has entangled these families in that, compared younger generations to relinquish their village land entitlement and contributed to the growing disconnect between grandparents who typically opt to stay in their traditional village homes and their children living in county apartments. So um, during my recent visit to W Village in the summer of 2023, I observed a significant exacerbation of the waiver shortage. Many grandmothers found themselves stretched thin as they juggled, uh, juggled responsibilities between their village homes and their children's uh, county apartments, where they assist with child rearing. Some attempted to con continue their weaving activities in urban apartments, but found it uh, rather cumbersome to transport raw materials and products, resulting in challenges in maintaining cleanliness and of organization. And mothers with school age children became less involved in village-based family e-commerce business, and some sought alternative career options in the county seat, primarily in the service sector. And those who ventured into moving their family e-commerce business to the county seat experienced a sharp rise in cost as they navigated the challenges of renting new office spaces and hiring employees. And this ultimately led many to exit the business uh, due to fierce competition and general economic downturn. So as the real estate-driven urbanization expands um, a pace with a kind of de-accelerated population growth, Rural China's capacity for reproduction is weakened, and along with it, the kind of sustainability of family-based e-commerce is already is also kind of fading uh, with uh, the um, gradually uh, disappearing Chinese villages. And the story of W Village and rural e-commerce, I hope, has uh, kind of offered us a grounded view of the transformation of the Chinese internet in the past 30 years, captured not only through uh, big in internet companies and state policies, but also through the kind of lived experiences of ordinary uh, rural families. So I'll stop here for the sake of time, and here are some of the related publications if you're interested in learning more. So I look forward to uh, the questions in the Q&A. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Zhang. Uh, we are doing um, excellently in terms of time. So um, we'll start our uh, Q&A session. Those who are in the audience, uh, please, uh, submit your questions uh, through Q&A. You can actually also raise your hand and I will just, I think there's a button I can just click and you can speak directly. Uh, for our panelists, uh, uh, please just raise your hand, you know, turn on your video and audio, you can speak directly as well. So I'm seeing a question from uh, Cao Xu. Yeah, I'm going to see whether you can Speak directly if you want to. Would you like to try? Okay, hello. I want to ask a question about a second presentation about metaphor of internet usage. 
I want to learn about are there any differences in the metaphor uses of for internet between China and other cultural contexts? Just want to learn more about this question. Can you give some examples or demonstrations? Thank you. Should I answer Professor Yang or just yeah, yes, please. The... Yes, please. Uh, I believe it's for you. Yeah, it's for me it's because I just noted uh, that um, our colleague already shared the question in the box, Q&A box. Uh, many thanks, Shui uh, Yen, for your uh, question. Yeah, actually, uh, we can just, there are four sets, probably four directions that might be useful to uh, categorize the metaphors. And uh, we actually can uh, identify one very particular, two particular examples from the pres pre for, for the presentations today. The one is related, actually is one, and because it's the, the very first uh, email that was sent uh, by China outside, okay? Um, and Chinese border is uh, across the, the great wall to reach every corner of the world, right? So this could be one, one example, the idea uh, to use the great, uh, the, 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 the great wall as a metaphor from the mm, Chinese side where it's kind of uh, emancipation, so just to embrace the, 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 the digital technology and to put behind this kind of uh, century of humiliation through the internet development. But on the other hand, we noted that um, the reference to the Great Wall was also reused by uh, scholars and more in particular US press magazines to identify this idea of uh, uh, censorship and um, um, yeah isolation compared to the world but uh, if you if you if you have, um, if you uh, if, if you have a look also to the present the third presentation of, provided by um, our colleague uh, Gabriele De Seta there is there, there might be also other idea to inter for inter to, to interpret to get inter an interpretation of the metaphor not only from uh, Western and the Chinese side, but also within China in itself. And indeed, the, the reference to the, 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 the um, academic community in Ebeida gives a, a, an answer uh, in this sense. In more general terms, uh, I would say that uh, there are at least four directions to, um, uh, to analyze this metaphor. The first one is to just, just it's very important to identify who says Okay, the, um, the, the the metaphor. In other words, who are the agents? Because as the, the very last part of my presentation uh, highlight uh, and uh, in line with Wyatt's article, metaphors are not just created by poets or writers or novelists, but also include um, poly, poly, policy maker, civil society, and eventually in private sector. So another, another question to be asked when we approach the analysis of the metaphor is when they are generated, okay? And the third one, the third one is for which purpose? Which are the places, online spaces, and virtual spaces or concrete spaces, real spaces, in which uh, these metaphors are supported or even contested? So, in other terms, the four direct, it is, this leads to the fourth and final question. Our, um, our, our role as researchers is just to, to identify a way to deconstruct me, me, metaphor, metaphors in order to analyze what is behind this kind of particular narrative. So, I hope that I answer to your, uh, to your, uh, to your question, Xue Yan. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, our next question is from Joanne Kwai for uh, Gabriel De Seta. And um, question is this, what do you expect would be the impact of algorithms, especially the fast developing generative AI technologies on the Chinese digital folklore and Chinese society at large? Yes, <clears throat> thanks Johan for the question. Um, I think we are already seeing some effects. So it's, um, because I really don't know what to expect, but um, I think we can look at what is already happening to kind of imagine what could could happen in the next five years. Um, the The interesting thing is that algorithms are a very broad category of stuff. Uh, so uh, 
we are already seeing uh, the effects of uh, algorithmic systems on Chinese society at large, um, especially through things like recommender systems in in apps like uh, I don't know Douyin or or even Jinju uh, Toutiao, like this kind of uh, news uh, gathering app that promote push content to people. So definitely, what what people see through uh, apps is being actively shaped not by human decisions, but by automated decisions. Um, uh, econ the economy is shaped by algorithmic systems, like all kind of price um, settling algorithms, for example, for, I don't know, getting a taxi or a car. Uh, again, not depending on, on human decision, but on calculations of uh, pretty opaque systems. Uh, but what, what interests me is the creative aspect, because, of course, uh, how information and, and money is... Uh, uh, manipulated by these automated systems is interesting, but I think that these systems also change what creativity is. So we were already seeing uh, communities like fandom being uh, shaped by algorithms. Uh, in EE has written quite extensively on this, um, on processes of algorithmic fandom. Um, and I have written about, for example, uh, deep fakes. So uh, using generative AI models to create fake uh, videos of uh, celebrities or of uh, manipulating uh, other private individuals' images for uh, more or less legal purposes uh, is already happening in China. So I think um, regulation is trying to catch up, but there will definitely be a period in which new forms of creativity enabled by algorithms uh, have unpredictable effects on society um and i think it will be it will become more and more uh, evident as we move on into yeah ai development so that's my answer thank you i have a question for um whoever wants to take uh from for all our panelists really so i get a sense from our discussions today that there's a lot of emphasis on the you know, we may say pluralization or uh, fragmentation is another term. You know, Florin talks about nationalisms. I think Liu Jun also talks about different kinds of uh, contentious politics. And there is a broader sense of uh, Chinese internet culture, politics, all kinds of expressive forms. We see a lot of uh, divide, you know, urban, rural, different kind of uh, user groups, different kind of issues. That's the broad sense I get. But I have a hunch, and correct me, and this is my question, really. I have a hunch that there are still times and issues that would bring people together. You know? There are unifying issues in the sense that uh, we see uh, the circulation connection of different, uh, different publics across platforms, across even across regions, you know, um, does that make sense? Am I correct? Uh, you know, uh, are there examples that anyone would like to share some thoughts on this question? Yes, Florent, please. Uh, yeah, I think your uh, instinct uh, is similar to mine <laughs> in that regard. Um, despite talking about the diversities that are possible and that happen on the back end of things, uh, I do think that we get these uh, these flash moments or flash points uh, where people align with each other around issues of, in my case, nationalism, uh, where all these diversities somewhat fall away. Um, the reason I still think it's important to talk about uh, this diversity uh, is for the same reason that people like Michael Billick and, and folks who followed up on his work talk about banal nationalism, the, the seemingly trivial things that happen, um, because it, it provides the resources from which people then build whatever becomes the mainstream. So coming from a discourse analysis perspective, I'm always very interested in what becomes hegemonic, um, but ultimately maybe it's a fallacy to think of just hegemonic, counter-hegemonic, but rather as these different kind of collaborations that create a commonsensical consensus. 
and I think that is what we then see activated, whether it's in uh, the kind of COVID nationalism that at least one of my PhD students is now researching, um, where we then also see, yeah, there's uh, certain things that float to the top, uh, or whether it's because we're interested in the front end versus back end, you know, sociologically speaking, uh, of communication, where, yeah, what we see on these platforms algorithmically curated as it is, uh, is the thing that shapes public discourse, even if it's not what most people think, doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is what defines the discussion, what frames it. Uh, and that's kind of where, where I locate a lot of my work. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear what some of the more anthropologically and ethnographically minded folks say uh, about what to make of this diversity and when it comes to the fore during political moments. So that's my take. Thank you, Florin. Um, Rombi? Thank you all. Um, it's great to be here and uh, um, such a wonderful collection of presentations. I appreciate um, and, and enjoy a lot of those and all of them and learned. Um, my question is like uh, more guilt toward Florin, but I think it probably is also related to um, other panelists um, in different ways. And uh, so basically uh, the question I've been thinking is about how do I understand Chinese internets and especially Chinese cyber nationalism um, in, in the context of a changing world? Because um, um, it's like Chinese internets and Chinese nationalism is reacting to what happens outside the, the uh, China. And also um, how Chinese internets, Chinese nationalism may be interacting with what is happening outside China. More specifically, I'm thinking, for instance, the rise of Trump actually has kind of, you know, a huge impact on Chinese internet, Chinese cyber politics in, in some very interesting ways, uh, more particularly Chinese nationalism, but also cyber culture, which related to what uh, um, uh, Gabriel has kind of presented. I think it's like, I would hear more from you guys about what you think. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Rongbing. Do we have uh, uh, other responses, either to Rongbing's uh, point or to the question I had early on? Florin, please. I don't want to hog the discussion, but since uh, Rongbing specifically was asking about nationalism, I can start us off and then maybe some other folks can uh, chime in. Um, Thank you. I, I can't speak to um, Trump popularity on the new left. I've only read about it. I've not actually studied it myself. But uh, I do think um, that while nationalism, especially the kind that I often study, which is about views of, say, Japan, right, uh, can be reactive because something happens in Japan and then people in China uh, feel they need to respond. Um, I do think... Uh, I, I don't know if it's ever proactive, but it's not necessarily always reactive to outside forces. Um, we saw this with um, with that uh, incident in Nanjing, right, where someone posted something years ago. Uh, someone had put up a, a, a plaque uh, commemorating uh, what turned out to be Japanese war criminals, uh, and the internet blew up over it, right? Uh, or things like uh, you know, some celebrity scandal, and then suddenly people feel compelled to cross the Great Wall, to jump the wall and do something abroad. So yeah, it's still reactive, but I think um, not solely in the way that we might think of reactive in the 90s where some state does something, but now all sorts of actors are up for grabs. Uh, and uh, it gets messy because sometimes it's just the fact that a I don't know, female Chinese uh, student says something in Maryland and all of a sudden nationalists get angry. Um, so it becomes far less easy to to manipulate and control, uh, certainly to calibrate. And I think uh, we have to place our focus more on the agency of the people who are actually shouting <laughs> into the void uh, and maybe also ask how does that shape nationalism elsewhere rather than the other way around. So yeah, I'm sure nationalists in China learn a lot from American alt-right folks. But uh, just like the alt-right has learned a great deal from right-wingers in Japan, I suspect at some point, if that's not already happening, they're going to learn a great deal from Chinese nationalists because of these fandom strategies and how effective they are. Thank you, Florin. Uh, Lin? Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, respond very quickly to uh, the question raised by Guo Bing and also uh, 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 I think it's Hong, uh, Rong Bing, right? Like you also mm -hmm. uh, raised a question. 
I feel like for me, uh, if we are looking for some kind of underlying connected, um, you know, uh, transformative forces that sort of defines the transformations um, and also kind of observed through our presentation is I think for one thing is uh, the greater kind of um, localization of the Chinese internet in a way driven by um, the expansion of the internet from previously mostly urban centric, middle class, cosmopolitan individuals, uh, largely, you know, uh, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, that would be the kind of general population of the Chinese internet. And I feel like in the past decade or so, uh, with uh, the expansion into rural, uh, really, um, and and you know, like smaller towns and cities, and and we witnessed the sort of a broaden of the internet, but also at the same times, um, kind of fragmentation of uh, interest, and uh, that's why we witnessed a lot of, you know, discussions about localities, you know. Um, uh, different pro provinces, um, you know, like Xian Yu, for example, county, sphere, economy, and things like that. So I feel like that's one force uh, that's led to the kind of diversification and fragmentation. Um, and at the same time, I think this force is reinforced by the sort of global um, uh, decoupling between the US and China in the kind of general Cold War situation. And so I think that defines uh, in a lot of way Chinese nationalism in a sense that I noticed that, you know, like on the Chinese internet, uh, you know, through, for example, WeChat content, um, all these kind of public, um, for example, uh, there's actually a lot of content about, for example, India and, you know, uh, Vietnam and other uh, parts of the world in a way that this, Kind of more open. I feel like China is in a uh, in a process of reposition in itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world, right? So, like, we on one hand we witness this, this kind of split between two camps, but also kind of redefining of the Chinese uh, identities with uh, some of the Chinese content going abroad, but also um, you know meeting confrontations and resistance at the same time. So I do feel like these kind of two forces, one on the local level, uh, driven by the expansion inward. Um, and one on the kind of global level, the kind of split and decoupling, especially, you know, reinforced by COVID isolation, that really defines the kind of my, uh, the change in micro changes that we they see in different spheres. Thank you, Lin. So, Jun? Yeah, thanks very much. I think I would like also quickly comment on Rongbing's question, as well as I think your earlier uh, question about this diversity. I, I mean, from my perspective, what we can see from the conversation today, besides this diversity of the internet, I, I my feeling is that we all address the issue of agents or agency in this case when we are talking about the like Chinese internet. So, which which agency that we are talking about? What is agency in the study of the the internet in China? Whether that's a state, that's a like different segment of population or algorithm, like uh, Gabriel. Uh, addressing this case. And, and I think in this case, when if we are thinking about the agency, I think from I think thinking about Rongbing's question, I'm also in line with Florian's um, um, like a, a short comment that in this case, probably we have to look beyond a kind of reaction in the case, for example, to 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 interpret the nationalism in this case. To me, that's also one of the reasons that I like address this this mundanity issue. That's that's I think whether it's nationalism and whether that's um the metaphors, whether that's um, um other kind of contention politics, then from my side, what I'm interested in is how we can like better interpret this kind of in um, you could say contingency and specificities. But also, you could say, look beyond those contingency and specificities uh, that we start an individual case in order to better understand Chinese internet. I think that would probably be be my like departing point um, um, or the, the comments in this case. Thanks. Thank you, Jin. So I see a question um, in the Q and A for Lin, and I. It's a little long. I'm going to read it so everyone in the audience uh, know what the question is about. Um, thank you for the insightful presentation. I've noticed that although some young rural live streamers 
may relocate to apartments in nearby counties or invest in real estate there, they often prefer returning to their village homes for video production or to sell their agricultural products. This preference seems rooted in the need to authenticate their offerings by showcasing their natural and social environment together with their daily life in rural China. Sometimes audiences are also tolerant of, of their constant trafficking between the rural village home and their urban apartment. This observation leads me to ponder how the village home or workshop becomes a stage for a certain type of intentionally crafted authenticity. Could you share your thoughts on this matter? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's uh, also, I, I, I echo your observation that uh, I think it's, especially in the past five years with the rise of live streaming and also sh short video platforms as a new kind of venue for uh, this kind of uh, creative expression and, um, uh, you know, the construction of uh, rurality, right? Uh, the kind of, um, uh, of imagination of a kind of a new rural life uh, with the sort of increasing investment, not just of state, but also industries into the rural area. I think all these convergence led to really a kind of a reimagination and of also reconstruction of the rural. And I, I think uh, for a lot of agents uh, that uh, people are rediscovering the value, not just the cultural value, but also the economic value of uh, rural China. So, um, so definitely, I, I I agree with you in terms of the need to uh, construct a particular kind of authenticity because in um, the industry, it's so competitive that uh, we've already kind of tired of um, the you know urban cosmopolitan. Uh, kind of Xiao Hongshu style uh, videos in a way, and people you know turn to Kuai Shou and other more to Wei and rural uh, websites um, to to look for something different, right? And also kind of a longing for a rural life uh, as China actually is going through rapid urbanization, right? So um, yeah, very very interesting observation. Yeah. So we are uh, getting to the closer to the end. Uh, I do have a question uh, for Gabrielle. Uh, I love the idea of uh, studying the internet from the perspective of folklore. And you have, you know, you, you provided a nice overview of this um, in the past several decades. My sense is that some of these, I mean, folk, when we think of folklore, we think of something that keeps, that lives on, right? in various ways that it will be passed around verbally in many other forms. And obviously much of the uh, examples, you know, the, the kind of uh, folklore uh, that you share lives on, but not necessarily all of them. I think some of them just, it's almost like to me, instead of folklore, they are like relics of the past that people have forgotten. Um, so my question is, do you have a sense of what kind of that history uh, is more likely to live live on as folklore, and what what kind will just become relics of the past and be forgotten by people? Yeah, I think you're right, uh, and I think that's a key part of this whole process because folklore is always depending on the performance and transmission and also uh, yeah, repetition and making sense of it. So I, I would say that actually most of it just becomes a relic of the past and uh, and is lost. Uh, a large part of this uh, three decades have been lost already, sadly. Um, even in the, the examples I showed, it was pretty hard to find, you know, the source emails or the some of those uh, ASCII uh, compositions are being preserved by an article, but you cannot find them online anymore. Um, the same for early Chinese websites. Luckily, I archived a bunch uh, years ago, but uh, they're harder and harder to find. Um, so I, I would say that a large part of it becomes quite ephemeral, um, tends to disappear. And especially now that we are all uh, using platforms and apps uh, controlled by, I don't know, Tencent or uh, ByteDance, uh, nothing is really preserved 
uh, on our own devices. It's all in the cloud. So it's up to these companies to kind of decide what remains uh, in, in the uh, public uh, memory. Uh, so I think the most important thing is actually what people do to, to keep uh, this kind of digital folklore alive. And most of it is through discussions and uh, individual practices. So every time someone saves a sticker on their WeChat and then shares it on a group and other people save it, that's a, that's actually, a, I think, a very important practice to preserve these things. Um, and the same is whenever people ask each other, you know, what does this mean? What is this um, meme about? Why is this funny? On a platform like Zuhu or, or things like these, these are actually very important uh, memory practices where people make sense of the Chinese internet uh, in an informal way. Uh, because otherwise, I think it would all disappear, uh, you know, rather quickly. Uh, because it's not in the interest of of any platform to really preserve all this stuff uh, historically. So that's also why I think uh, scholarship is important and documenting these things that maybe look not so important, but uh, uh, yeah, we need to actively make them into something that can be preserved. But yeah, thanks for the question. Wonderful, thank you. So. Um... Any final question before we close? I think, yeah, we are certainly, uh, yeah. Um, Jialungi, please. Uh, no, it was just a very quick comment to your quest, previous question, uh, Professor Young. It just uh, the, it is very in line with the question you addressed to Gabriele because probably, yeah, it's true. Um, we also agree with you that the topics of today um, is very much in line with this idea of fragmentation, but probably and also in line with the, um, the, 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 the goal of the, the workshop today, which should be retrospective. One very useful, probably, um, uh, idea and method would be to invest on the analysis of the memory in order to identify the instead of focusing a little bit more on the fragmentation and the um, turning points that are being characterized the evolution of the Chinese internet, we should probably invest more about the continuity that uh, that um, that uh, are basically reflect um, this particular medium. But of course, I could agree more with Gabriel that there are issues issues that are not only technical but also in terms of uh, scholarship also is the topic that raised. Uh, was arised by 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 the Florian, but I think we all should know about this effort to evaluate to 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 put a light to invest a little bit more historical approach that uh, might be useful to connect the dots and eventually uh, in order to identify more more uh, uh, or at least context this idea of fragmentation that uh, has been has been emerged today. That was was just a very short comment. Great, thank you. We do get another question from Professor Calvin Hui. Calvin, would you like to uh, just say a question? Um, yes. Um, so, uh, Gabriel, uh, you in your talk, uh, you mentioned a meme called uh, 学术真的很无聊. Uh, what do you <laughs> What do you think about that? Oh, uh... I made that one as an example, so <laughs> it's not really representative. Um, but but it was uh, because I, in that I was writing about uh, how those kind of stickers are made in QQ. Um, so uh, I've wrote a whole article about the process through which uh, a friend of mine in China taught me how to uh, create stickers um, based on what he was doing to, to make a series of stickers. So the the what I can say is that the image I was using is taken from a popular series of like those uh, comic figures that are often um, taken from other sticker packs or from actually quite popular illustrators in China, and then through the the kind of uh, QQ editor um, at that time you could just import an image and then add a textual caption on it. So in that case, I just put the uh, like you know funny. Uh, a funny comment on scholarship um, <laughs> as to, to show how the meme is made, but it's not an actual one, um, just one I made, for example. But it does show how that that part of the software works, um, or it worked at that time. I'm not sure if QQ still has this function. 
but it is very similar to how people create um, stickers on WeChat. Actually, uh, you just uh, you know you can you can edit images on your phone and then upload them as a pack and um, create them. So it's it's very minor, small practices by people, by ordinary people who create a sticker, and ninety nine point nine percent never become that popular. But a few of them uh, become quite popular and are shared by people and maybe bought or sold as sticker packs, and that's you know that's how this kind of folklore emerges. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I doubt whether this particular piece of folklore will live on uh, because I think Xiu Shu is, as, as is, <laughs> we know from today, is very <laughs> interesting. I agree, I agree. <laughs> um, well, uh, well we, I think we are going to close today. And uh, I'd just like to say that um, with uh, today's session, we have completed the portion of the series I mentioned earlier on. Um, and, and this portion is hosted by the Center on Digital Culture and Society and Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. I would like to thank all our speakers again uh, at all our three sessions, the in-person session and two virtual sessions for their very rich and for your very rich and inspiring presentations. Thank you also to all the audience um, today and in previous sessions for joining our workshop and sharing very constructive comments and questions. Uh, I want to thank our team again at uh, Pan, Junyi, Jingyi, and Quan for, uh, for your hard work. Um, I, I look forward to seeing everyone um, at ICA or IM, AMCR this year uh, or on other future occasions. Uh, as I, Again, as I mentioned earlier on, we have a final uh, round table at ICA uh, this year in June. So um, have a great day to those in Europe and uh, North America and good night to everyone in Asia. Bye-bye, everyone.